Hello, Eric Rexted from the University of St. Andrews again. I'm going to build on information I provided to you in the previous lecture where we were talking about the ideas that underlie distance sampling. Now I want to look at the other end of the spectrum about data collection. And that's where you, as observers, play a fundamental role. The idea of this conversation with you is to get you to appreciate how you can bring your field methodology closer to the concepts that underlie distance sampling so that the data you collect can be readily analyzed and understood using the distance sampling analysis methods. So. I have a few things that I want to try to accomplish in this lecture. I want to try to give you the idea of the assumptions that underlie distance sampling, namely all animals are seen on the transect, all animals are stationary at the time the survey is being conducted, and that all measurements of these distances are correct. And we'll talk about the ways in which field methods can be made to make those statements at least approximately correct. I'll then go through some general ideas of good things to do in terms of field protocols. And then I'll talk about a couple of field uh, special situations before I summarize. So there's always a chance that um, when bad things happen in the field, that can scupper the opportunity to do a comprehensive analysis of survey data. And so the idea here is to have the assumptions of the methods being used, in this case distance sampling, make those methods most likely to be true. And again, I'll repeat what those assumptions are. That animals on the transect are detected for certain. We call that the G0 assumption. Or said yet another way, detection of animals at distance 0 from the transect line is equal to 1. We see or we detect everything on the transect. We also hope that animals aren't moving in response to us, the observers, before we detect them. We also strive to make sure that the distances at which we detect our animals are measured and recorded correctly. And we also want to try to have this thing called a detection function have a specific property, namely the property of a wide shoulder. <clears throat> so, as you know, or as I hope you know, living underneath these things called detection functions, the blue lines or the red lines, are the idea of the data that you as observers have collected. And those data have been transformed into a histogram of the distances from the transect line. So living underneath all of these detection functions that I'll be showing you are the idea of the data that you have collected in the form of these histograms of perpendicular distances. So the data that you collect doesn't tell us anything about whether we detect all the animals on the transect. The only way we can try to ensure that all animals on the transect are detected is by using good field methods and by using common sense to try to live up to or abide by this assumption that all animals on the transect are detected. In addition to trying to detect all animals on the transect line, we also recognize that detectability of our animals is going to diminish as those animals appear farther and farther away from our transect. 
that's a given. That's understood about distance sampling, that this detection probability declines as a function of perpendicular distance. However, what we would hope is that the rate at which detectability declines is fairly slow at small distances. In other words, we want the probability of detecting animals to remain very high out to some distance before those that probability of detection begins to diminish. And so the preferable situation to find yourself in is to gather data such that you have a detection function that looks like this blue line in contrast to a detection function that looks like the, the red um, dashed line. So here's where the common sense comes in. What can you do to try to cause your histogram or your detection function to more closely resemble the blue line than to resemble the red dashed line? The answer to that question may lie in having more than one person, more than one observer, assist in the detection process, looking, looking for animals on the, along the transect line. The other thing that comes to pass, the other issue that comes to bear, is how you, as an observer, work to try to detect animals. And so the idea is you want to focus your attention closest close to the transect line. And we'll see, we'll see an example of that in a moment. But when you hear someone speak about having a shoulder in the detection function, the idea is just like the shoulder that connects your arm to your body is to have um, high probabilities of detection at small distances from the line before detectability begins to drop off. As I've said, there are underlying these detection functions that we're trying to fit to the data that you collect are these histograms of the perpendicular distances that you observed. And so there's, there's a close relationship between the histograms of your data and the detection functions that eventually get fitted to those data. So the only information that the statistician or the analyst has when they try to estimate what a detection function looks like is the histogram of the data that you collected. And so it is the process of fitting a function to the data that you collected that is fundamental to this business about fitting a detection function and using that detection function to estimate the proportion of animals inside the truncation distance that the observers that you fail to detect. So notice I've provided just a random sample of different kinds of histograms and these are all these are all shapes of histograms that I have seen in data that people have provided to me to help them analyze. We have a situation where we have too many data collected, detected close to the transect line. Conversely, we have a situation here in which too few detections are made close to the transect line that doesn't conform to the idea that the probability of detecting animals diminishes as we get farther from the transect. We have another, a couple of other interesting types of histograms that can arise for a variety of reasons. It's not uncommon for uh, <coughs> observers that are in need of training for observers to guess 
or round the distances at which they think animals were sighted. And so that, <clears throat> that phenomenon is called heaping or rounding. And the situation arises in which we have too many detections at these favored distances that end in zero, like 10 or 20 or 30, at the expense of detections that actually probably were at in these other distance categories, but those distance categories didn't happen to be favorite numbers of the observers. And so there are point of this point of this slide is to try to um, demonstrate to you that there are various different shapes that these histograms can take on. And the, those histograms are representations of the data that you collect, the perpendicular distances that you collect. And histograms will be fitted based on the information that's contained inside those histograms. And so your role in your data collection is central to the ability of people that come along after you who are trying to perform the detection function modeling work and consequently producing the estimates of pr probabilities of detection. So each of you watching this video differ in your ability to perceive the animals that you're out to study. And those differences are based on just inherent characteristics of you as a person and also based upon, uh, also differ as a result of the experience and the training that you've received. And so the nature of your inherent ability as well as the nature of your characteristics that you employ when you are searching for animals influence the shape of these detection functions. And these are actual detection functions that were fitted to, I think, something like 10 observers who are all engaged in the same in survey. So it's not that these were different surveys. This was all from the same survey. But different individuals engaged in that survey had different capacities, different capabilities, and as a result lead to differences in detection functions. The hope by watching this video is for you to try to produce um, consistent behavior so that there's a bit more constancy or a bit more conformity in the shape of the detection functions that you and your colleagues use. That reduces the amount of variability in the data that you've collected, and reduced variability in data leads to much more consistent results and findings. So back to the assumptions that I was speaking of earlier. We want there to be perfect detection of animals on the transect line. Now remember that's referred to as g of 0, probability of detection at distance 0, is equal to 1. A probability equal to 1 means that something is certain. So your job as observers is to try to ensure that the data you collect is close to fulfilling this idea of detectability on the transect line being perfect. However, you have you also are relieved of the responsibility of trying to see everything. Remember, distance sampling doesn't assume that you see everything within your field of view. It assumes you see everything on the transect, everything in front of you, but it is possible that you have that you fail to detect animals that are at distances from the transect line. So keep these two cardinal rules in your thoughts that try to see everything on the line, but don't necessarily try to see everything 
at distances, particularly great distances, away from the transect. Now, what, is, what do these cartoons have to do with this idea? Well, this is actually a study, this is a, a story associated with one of the developers of distance sampling theory, a gentleman by the name of Jeff Lake. And many years ago, when Jeff was developing distance sampling, he uh, did a study in which he placed pounded wooden stakes into the ground, terrestrial survey. So he pounded 150 stakes into, um, into the ground, but left them, left them exposed a small distance. So detectability was difficult, but not impossible. And, and consequently, he had um, friends of his, fellow students of his, uh, go through his study area and try to detect the stakes and measure the perpendicular distances. And so by that, <coughs> in that manner, he was trying to see how well distance sampling worked in this um, fabricated situation of this population of wooden stakes. And as people were collecting data, Jeff was observing them to see how they how they performed. This person is intended to represent Jeff's wife, and she went through the uh, the study area, <clears throat> recording, detecting these stakes and recording their perpendicular distances. She found she detected fifty five of the hundred and fifty stakes. So a little over a third of the stakes she was able to detect. And her estimate of population size was reasonably close to the true population size. But as this cartoon was tending to indicate, um, Marilyn, Jeff's wife, didn't have perfect eyesight. And so she tended not to see these wooden stakes that were very far off the transect, but she was very good at detecting transect, detecting stakes that were close to the transect. So the number of things she saw, excuse me, let me go back. The number of stakes that she saw wasn't very high, but yet she was able to achieve pretty good results from the data that she collected. In contrast, one of Jeff's fellow graduate students was um, prided himself on being able to have really good vision and really good ability to detect things. And so he worked very hard and saw quite a few more stakes than Jeff's wife saw. In fact, he was working so diligently that he was searching, his searching pattern, his searching behavior was to look very far away from the transect, to try to see as many things as he could see anywhere on or off the transect. And as a result, he was able to see quite a few more stakes than Jeff's wife was. However, in the process of looking far away from the transect to see these all of these stakes, <clears throat> Jeff, who was observing this fellow, noted that at one point, when walking down the transect, he got his trouser leg caught on some undergrowth, he thought. And so, without giving it a second thought, he simply shook his leg to free his pant cuff from that underbrush and carried on. However, it wasn't undergrowth that he had caught his trouser leg on. It was actually a stake that he had caught his trouser leg on. But not looking down to, to see that it was a stake, he failed to record it. And so in doing so, he violated this assumption of detecting all of the stakes that were on the transect line. As a result of failing to see all the stakes on the transect line, his estimate of abundance was actually quite a good distance away from truth, even though he saw more objects, saw more animals, saw more stakes. Moral of this story, 
is just by collect just by making lots of detections won't necessarily improve the quality of the data. So the quality of the data is not determined by numbers of detections alone. So in your work, what can you do to try to help fulfill this idea that detection probability on the transect is perfect? Well, I know most of you won't be working in airplanes, but we'll take, we can use an example from an airplane situation to try to help us understand what we can do. With airplanes, of course, it's not possible to see directly, not always possible to see directly underneath the plane, to see directly onto the transect when you're looking out a side window like this. And so when looking out a side window, the histogram of detections may resemble this blue histogram. Not very many detections close to the line, lots of detections at some middling distance, and again, not very many detections far from the line. Because of this obstructed vision, if you want to think of it that way, underneath the plane. You can't really see under the plane. A way to get around that difficulty under some circumstances is to put a second window on the plane that's called a belly window. And it is exactly in the, in the belly of the plane. And so an observer is essentially lying on the floor of the plane looking straight down. And of course, the observer that's looking straight down is not going to be seeing many detections at very great distances because their vision is restricted in the other way. They can see below them pretty well, but they can't see out at distance. Combining the information from these two observers can give rise to a detection function, give rise to a histogram that can be modeled quite nicely. <clears throat> so the idea here is to have a second observer that might be able to overcome the obstructions that may exist in airplanes. Now, some of you on board some ships may also have obstacles that um, impair your ability to make detections at, at, all, at all angles from you. So the second, the second uh, diagram is intended to show the way in which a second observer might be able to enhance the detection process on board a ship. If you have two observers working on the port and starboard side of the ship, you might instruct them to have one observer looking from a beam to some number, some distance to the starboard of straight ahead. So one observer is viewing this arc for detections. The other observer is focusing, concentrating their effort from a beam to just beyond the bow in this direction. And so one observer is looking here for detections. The other observer is looking here for detections. And as a consequence, there is an overlap in sighting effort here close to the transect. And so in this way, the behavior of the two observers produces an overlap of effort that is in line with trying to conform to the assumption of detectability on the transect being perfect. So there are ways in which you can use your creativity on board the ship to try to come as close as feasible to these kinds of the assumptions that distance sampling uses.
No matter how clever you are, though, it's likely to be the case that detection probability on the transect line is a bit less than one. So animals can be missed. The consequence of animals missed on the transect is that if you are trying to estimate absolute abundance, missing animals causes an underestimate, a direct consequence of this being the case is that you will underestimate abundance. Now there are methods, there are um, procedures such that will allow you to produce an estimate of g of zero. I'll not go into the details about that, but they involve independent observers or it might involve having some technological aids or it might um, come about by having um, separate surveys or separate investigations targeted only at the estimation of g of zero. Anyhow, my point is your, your intention is to try to come as close as is practicable to making g of zero equal to one. The next issue I wanted to raise your consciousness about is the effect of movement. The idea of almost all survey methodologies is that it captures the population of interest at a snapshot in time, just a point in time. I've done this survey, snap my fingers, that's the size of the population I'm trying to understand. And so the the theory that underlies distance sampling and most other estimation methods is that animals aren't moving because this survey is taking place at an instant in time. And so, as you might expect, animals that move create difficulties, create challenges for trying to do population assessments. And so, you, back to you, what does this mean for you? Your responsibility as an observer is to try to come as close as can be expected to having, to overcoming the effect of animal movement. Saying that another way, you want to be able to detect animals prior to the time that they detect you. Now, how do you do that? Recognize you're trying to make as many detections as you can close to the transect. <clears throat> you're going to make detections of animals close to the transect by looking forward on, on the vessel. And by looking forward on the vessel, if you can look at great distances ahead of the vessel, that increases the probability that you are making detections of the animals before they are recognizing that the ship is, is approaching. And so another aspect of your searching behavior or your scanning behavior is to try to minimize this effect of movement. And a way to minimize the effect of movement is by <clears throat> looking ahead of the vessel, trying to, to detect animals before they detect you. What I, mean to, what I mean to portray or depict in this, in this graph is, again, we have an idealized detection function in blue, but it might be the case that your histogram, and hence your detection function, might actually more closely resemble this. Now, that a shape such as this might be caused by animals that were close to the transect at small distances were actually moving away from the transect and were responding to the approach of the ship by moving away from the transect. Now that might, that's one explanation, it's a possible explanation, 
for the shape of that detection function, but we can't be certain. And so, as I say here, the effect of responsive movement on your histogram, on your perpendicular distances, won't necessarily be as obvious as I've depicted it here. And so you have you have reduced ability to try to analyze your way out of responsive movement. So there's, there's little that can be done with data that have been contaminated by animal movement after the data have been collected. It's better to try to um, mitigate the possible consequence of responsive movement during the data collection exercise. As you all know, distance sampling, the clue is in the name, you have to collect good distances. Yeah. <clears throat> Oftentimes it's the case that in the data collection you're not actually measuring the perpendicular distance between the animal and the transect. Instead, you're measuring the distance to the animal and the bearing off the bow to that animal using, using an angle board like this or on board a ship, an angle board that looks like this. Uh, there are many, many technological tools that are available to you. There are <clears throat> reticles that exist on binoculars. There are laser rangefinders that are, under some circumstances may be, may be useful to you. The point of this slide isn't to say, here are all the tools you might ever possibly use to help you make accurate measurements of distances and angles. The point of this slide is to say, don't guess about an angle or a distance. We're, we're very bad at guessing distances without some sort of tool, without some sort of aid. We're very bad at guessing angles because again we'll use, um, we'll round those angles. We'll use numbers that are comfortable to us. <clears throat> oh, that animal was at 60 degrees. Oh, that animal was at 30 degrees. We're hardly ever going to guess that an animal was at 27 degrees. Mm. So my advice, my point to you is there's lots of there's lots of uncertainty associated with a field survey. Don't add to the uncertainty of a field survey by guessing one of the most critical aspects of the data that you'll collect, namely <clears throat> the distances or the angles. Use what tools are available to you that you've been trained to use by your organization. It's fundamentally critical. There are lots of ways in which um, animals can try to defeat this process of helping you collect accurate data. <clears throat> Some of the animals that you'll study travel in schools. And so what distance you do you record when you have animals that travel in schools? The correct answer is we want to know where the center of that school is. Now, sometimes to be able to measure where the center of that school is, you might measure what its closest, what the closest, the distance of its closest edge and the distance of its farthest edge. But it's also important that if you do that, that you recognize that sometimes one edge might be to starboard of the ship's path, and the other edge might be to port of the ship's path. 
the correct the correct distance here is the center. The correct distance to record here is not zero just because the ship's path crosses that school somewhere. We've, we've seen uh, examples of data that have come to us in which 50, 60, 70 percent of the data had perpendicular distances of zero. The reason for that was that um, it was a survey done of animal schools and the folks that collected the data misunderstood the premise of distance sampling and any time a school intersected the transect they recorded a distance zero. The point of all of this is that animals that travel in schools require you to work more diligently to collect your data because not only do you have to record the perpendicular distance of the center, it may be difficult to figure out where that center is. In addition to that, it may also be challenging to you to be able to recognize the number of individuals that, that constitute that school. Nevertheless, both of those aspects are important in being able to apply distance sampling to animals that travel in schools. Now on to some general ideas, some general recommendations. During the process of collecting data, don't just assume that all is going well. During the data collection process, talk to your fellow observers and when you're off effort. Right? When you're off effort, when you're on effort, concentrate your attention only on collecting data. That's not the time to be engaging in conversation. But when you're off effort, then you can be comparing the nature of the data that you've gathered and reviewing those data both with your colleagues and with your organizational team leaders to understand whether the quality of the data is good. Don't leave it until the end of the cruise or six months after the cruise is over to say, oh, I wonder what, I wonder how those data I collected actually looks. It's important to, important to think about and scrutinize your data often. Your organizations that are involved in setting up these surveys have probably spoken to you about how to do the data recording. But the point of the point of the next couple of slides is to ask you to be cognizant of the fact that um, you have a difficult job to perform. You have a difficult job not only to detect animals, but having detected the animals, you also have to record what you've detected and remain the idea of data recording is that it should not unduly take away from your observing process and so the hope is that the data recording is fairly easy for you to do and recognize what the most important components of the data that you observe should be. We need to know, being that it's distance sampling, we need to know these perpendicular distances or the radial distance and angle. Those things have to be recorded. If those things aren't recorded, then it's very difficult to do distance sampling on the results. As I just mentioned, it's important to record school size or cluster size using your best efforts to try to estimate that. You'll also need to be able to know the, the transect to which that particular detection is associated. 
because that's, that's an important facet of subsequent analysis. It's also critical to know effort. How long was the transact that was surveyed? Those things are fundamental. You can't make progress without collecting, without recording those pieces of information. If there is time, then other information, start time, end time, date, the weather condition, whether you could define the sex of the species, what the habitat conditions were, those things are nice to have. And again, you can do with the the more data that are recorded, the more sophisticated the analysis can be. And so it's useful to have those pieces of information. But if you find yourself in a difficult circumstance because you have many detections coming at you quickly, you need to be able to, as I'll mention in a moment, you need to be able to streamline the data collection process. And so knowing which data not to record is very important. And so remember, the priorities are to collect, to record these pieces of information. And then additional pieces of information can be recorded if time allows. We argue that trying to maintain the high quality of data at the expense of the volume of data is a, a decent compromise and is preferable to having large quantities of data, but, if the, but those data are of poor quality. So strive to have high quality data, even if it means reductions in the amount of data gathered. to try to make that data collection as easy as possible. Hopefully you have dedicated field sheets that have clearly identified fields that you need to fill in. Practice using those field forms. Get to know those field forms before the excitement of, oh my goodness, I just saw the most, the most exciting breach of a whale I've ever seen oh, where am I supposed to write that information down? Recognize that during a field survey, things can get to be quite hectic. And so be very comfortable with your tools, particularly including your data sheets. Be very comfortable with your tools before all of the excitement of the actual survey sets in. If you're lucky, you might be able to have a dedicated recorder that's, that's assisting in the data recording exercise. Also, recognize that accidents happen and try to have some system in place so that you have copies of the data that you record. I just said that it can be quite exciting when the survey actually starts and you actually start to make detections. By the same token, it can also be quite boring. I mean, it may be the case that you go for long periods of time without seeing any animals, and that can be frustrating, and it can lead to boredom. And so we want to make sure that there is accommodation for rest breaks and time away from the binoculars, time off the deck so that you have, so that when you are on effort, you truly are on effort. And when you're off effort, you truly are off effort. We realize that it's human nature to be, to wish to be able to record anything that you see on your data sheets. However, as you know, there is a truncation distance associated with distance sampling surveys. Detections beyond five nautical miles or eight kilometers or some distance such as that 
those detections provide very little information in terms of trying to estimate what this detection function looks like. The main nature of this detection function is the where it intersects the y-axis and the speed with which it drops off. Detections that are made at great distances provide very little information about this y-intercept or the, the rate of decline of that shoulder. And so information at great distances is not of extremely high value. And so you need to, you need to be cognizant of that and re record distances, but those distances might be very difficult to accurately measure at those great distances. And so recognize that there are difficulties associated with detections made at great distances. And so record them, but recognize that they have not terribly high value. And so we'll, you will record them, but you'll, there'll be the recognition that they may not get included in the final analysis. I've already mentioned the ideas associated with training yourself to make detections, to, to look for animals in a way that's consistent with the concepts of distance sampling. And so recognize that you want to exert your visual effort close to the transect line, in the vicinity of the transect line. It's fine to look a beam, it's fine to make detections you know, look to the horizon. But I've already said detections that are made on the horizon don't have very much information content. And so emphasize that you're looking close to the transect. Also recognize that your job is to try to detect animals before they detect you. So try to look ahead. It's certainly not wrong to look behind you. It might be the case that from time to time, assuming there are no impediments uh, restricting your vision behind, it's mi it might be useful every now and again to take a look to see if, particularly if, there were, if you were busy recording information, an animal may have, may have been available to you to be detected while you were busy writing things down. You might take a look over your shoulder and say, were there, any were there any animals that I failed to detect while I was recording the previous detection? And so recognize that knowing how to, how to search consistent with the ideas and the objectives of the survey is not the same as going out and having a recreational uh, a recreational cruise. You know, when you're when you're just cruising for the sheer enjoyment of seeing animals, that kind of searching process is different than the kind of searching process you will engage in when you are recording data for a survey such as the one you're working on. And hopefully your um, organizations will speak to you about that and work with you about how these data, how searching protocols should be done. I'm, I said I was going to make a couple of comments about special circumstances. One special circumstance is having is being on a multi-species survey. And those types of surveys can throw up some difficulties or challenges that you need to be prepared for. 
and of the other special circumstance that I that I make mention of here is you might find yourself in a circumstance where you become swamped where you have many many detections that's a lovely situation to be in you're seeing many many animals or detecting many many animals but it throws up some challenges to you as well so the challenge of multi-species surveys is different species for a single observer different species are going to have different detection functions right it's much easier presumably to see a sperm whale at the surface uh, one kilometer away from the transect than it is to see harbor porpoises on the surface one kilometer away from the transect so different species will have different detection functions. And so you, your detection process is going to be different for the different species. It's also the case that when you are trying to deal with multiple species, you may have some taxonomic challenges. You may have difficulty identifying, is that species A, is that species B? So recognize that there are some challenges associated with performing multi-species surveys that don't uh, arise when you're only doing a survey for a single targeted species. That said, I should mention to you that even though you're on a multi-species survey, it's almost invariably the case that that survey is being done with some target species in mind. And so again, your organization and your team leaders ought to give you some insight into we're really most interested in information about species X and Y. It would be nice to gain information about species Z, but if you're in a difficult situation, you can ignore information about species Z in preference to information about species X and species Y. Okay. Similarly, whether you're on a multi-species or a single species survey, it might be the case that you find yourself in a situation where you have, where you're swamped. You have too many detections to process at um, at any given instant. And so what to do, what sort of triage, what sort of priorities ought you to assign when you find yourself in a high density situation? Well, there are several things you can do. One thing to do is to reduce the amount of time spent recording data. And remember, I gave you a priority list of these are the most important pieces of data to record, and these are less important pieces of data to record. And so if you get into a high-density situation, say, all right, I'm not going to be able to record information about sea state. I'm not going to be able to record information about um, something else. I'm going, to, I'm going to jettison that information so that I can concentrate on more important information. Another strategy that you can employ in high density situations is to say, remember these detections made at great distances don't carry a great deal of information content. And so detections at eight nautical miles, 10 nautical miles, 12 nautical miles have very low information content. I won't even, I will just focus my attention closer in and I'll, I'll bring my attention in which has the which has the consequence of making that truncation distance smaller and so now you the area that you're trying to survey has shrunken because you've you've essentially brought your blinders in you can continue to collect data on those at those uh, small distances while you're in a high density region, 
and then when the, the high density drama is over, you can go back to your um, previous search pattern that says, all right, now I'm going to look at, at uh, greater distances. So knowing what the priorities are will help you cope with difficult situations such as these multi-species or high density situations. All right, thanks for paying attention this far. This is my last slide, my final thoughts. If you have challenges, if you have difficulties in co data collection and data recording during a survey, those cannot necessarily be overcome by some magic wand during the analysis. As a consequence, the decisions that you make and the data that you record during the survey that you're engaged in is absolutely vital. And so everything that you do during your survey involves making decisions about how should I search? What should I write down? When should I, did I really make a detection? How big was that school size? All of those things require decisions on your part. And the nature of the decisions that you make will influence the quality of the data that you bring back from your survey. And so your role in this is absolutely central. While doing your surveys, think carefully about how you are doing your searching behavior, how you're doing your scanning. Work with your colleagues and the organization with which you find yourself to try to come up with a consistent manner in which you're doing your scanning. Once your scanning has paid off and you have detections, please be very careful and accurate in collecting those detection angles and detection distances. Don't guess. We have tools available to improve upon guesswork. And hopefully, you haven't found this, these videos to be too terribly painful. You can look at them again whenever you need to, to try to refresh your memory on some of the ideas that I've talked about. We continue to add information about field methods, about surveys, about tools, about techniques related to distance sampling on our website, distancesampling.org. So come back again and visit that website and enjoy the process of your surveys.